Hello, um, my name is Dave Davis. Uh, I'm a sculptor. I've uh, been doing sculpture well, most of my, all of my adult life and probably started when I was about 14 or even earlier than that when my dad gave me a pocket knife. Uh, my dad was an artist and um, he did a lot of the the work that I'm doing today. Um, he, he was more of a flat art um, personality, but he liked, he enjoyed the uh, sculpture as well. And when he was in college and uh, art school, he was, he got into the sculpture pretty, pretty heavily, but he did mostly abstract art and uh, eventually made most of his money through uh, commercial art. Uh, it paid the bills, raised a family, and myself, I, w I've been a, I was a firefighter. Uh, I was a firefighter for 34 years, and I was fortunate in that I was able to always continue my, my art throughout my career because of our shift work and um, with our days off and, and the time off that we did have, it allowed me to stay very involved in what I was doing. Um, I spent a lot of time outdoors. I, I get most of my inspiration outdoors in the, in the wild. Uh, I'm fortunate that where I'm, uh, we've been able to live our life out in the rural community and, and, and into uh, as close a thing to out your door nature. And we've always enjoyed that and I suppose that's a big part of uh, why I do wildlife. The other thing I, I do like to do is uh, human, the human form, um, bringing out personality and that type of thing. But with with the animals, uh, there's a you can get a, a pretty deep connection with what you see out in the wild and when you're when you're watching it out in its in its own habitat and how life works together. There is no opposition. There's predator and prey. But it's it's not a conscious or malicious effort. It it comes naturally. They just they don't realize. They just do what they do. In, instinct tells them this is what we do to survive, and it, it's been passed down through all the all of time. And I just find it so amazingly consistent. And how I believe the Lord provides for everything, although there is still life and death. But uh, what I wanted to show today is some of the the different things that I, I do like to work in and what I believe is necessary to try to come up with some some uh, sense of realism, um, accuracy, and and believability and, and bring out the, the personality or the attitude and, and part of the life in, in which you are sculpting that particular piece. Um, we, through, the, through this video, showed my dog. My dog is uh, this sculpture right here. This is just basically a study piece. And what, it, what you try to do there is uh, bring out its character, bring out its personality, and, and you can see her cockeyed ear that that she's had from day one. She can lift one, not the other. Her her relaxed pose, but she's also you can tell by her posture and her legs that she's content. She's not anxious. She's she's attentive, but very comfortable. And it that's what I I think is nece necessary to sort of accomplish your goal. Now, everybody's goal can be different. You can have contemporary art, you can have, um, sort of interpretive, like you, you look at this nativity scene. This is actually just a cold cast, um, but it's, it's quite a departure from the realism, but it still shows you attitude. It shows you what it is you, you're trying to see, the closeness, the awe of what has just happened, uh, little baby Jesus just being born, and and the we, we all know the story, 
but just to be able to see that closeness. Everybody's wrapped around each other. There's there's a sense of support and there's a sense of reality and and an awareness of what just happened. So these are all things that you you want to try to incorporate. What is it you're trying to say? Now you you see the lines where I have everything I coming together. You've got your arms around each other. It's all nothing wants to take you away from the peace. It wants to keep you centered in on what it is that's important. Everything kind of focuses right to the baby Jesus. And um, these are things that have to be thought out beforehand. Um, what it is you're trying to what you're trying to say. Now you can you can fool around a lot. You know, you start with some sketches and and or just a small maquette, a little clay, just to see, deal with those those issues that would distract you from what it is you're trying to accomplish. And uh, so, success or not depends on how well you achieve those things, and that's you you judge that yourself. But it but the process is nonetheless has to be there. What you think is how it turned out is another story. But that's that's up to the, the person looking at, and that's where views and opinions come in. But the process and the thought should be, you should try to maintain that at least. Um, this isn't nearly as important, this was just a commission piece, uh, the guy wanted it, and but you want to try to complete it. Now this, this is just a simple hood ornament for a Peterbilt, but it's not a matter of just building the guy a skull the way like he wants a longhorn steer. You have to complete the project. That's There's a difference between throwing out something like art, but taking it from start to finish in a complete and professional manner. I mean, there's a, there's a difference between throwing art out there and, and fine art. Fine art is a, is a, is a very deep process that takes a lot of a lot of thought and uh, to complete it and to try and achieve it so you, you maintain some body some strength but still keep the like I've got the spine starting to come down through here so it, it just uh, completes the completes the piece you're not guessing it's just all there but yet it's not and I don't know how to explain that too much you, you let certain details shine through where you can neglect other things because uh, they're not important to the piece. And that's a, that's a bit of a difficulty for me because I spent many, many years doing sort of hyper-realism in my wood carvings and sculptures and just about everything I did. And it's, it's very hard to break away from because you're used to really picking out all the things that really make it, whereas we're not looking at this through a microscope, we're not looking at this to see if there's a hundred barb lines per per inch or, or whatever. Feather count's important, not critical, because it, there again it depends on what you're trying to display. In, in a, like this falcon for instance, yeah I do have the the feather counts are all correct and because you're splaying it, you're showing it. So if you're showing it for that purpose. The reason I the reason I did that on this particular piece, just as long as we're talking about um, what we look at when we're what moves us or what we're trying to accomplish. This Merlin, this Merlin with the mountain bluebird, um, I chose this uh, most of these things I've seen in nature, or I've, I've witnessed, and, and therefore you have a mental image of what it is you want to see. And uh, uh, this, this I came upon this one time, and this was a, a mountain birdhouse for a mountain bluebird. And uh, what appealed to me when I saw the whole thing was that yet the, the, the birdhouse was man-made, yet it... it look completely like it belonged. It was organic. It was it was part of what I saw. Uh, when I was looking at the, the lines, I was watching, I, I, you couldn't help but notice the lines that run through the, 
and the shadows through the through the birdhouse itself. But the lines also that the birds were holding, all the, the repetition of these these same lines throughout and how it blended in yet was one is at, uh, all natural and the other one was man-made but it, it fit perfectly together and I, I felt also that there was a a bit of a statement in, in the fact that the, the, the house that bird, uh, housed the bird became the eating platform for the for the falcon and uh, just how efficient and how quick it all happened and it's the bird's excitement and alertness as to anything that was around it it was it was just su super focused on anything that was moving or or even possible threat because he had his kill and wasn't want to wasn't want to lose it so it just the way that I brought out these repetitions and these lines that went along with all the lines of the house and, and the, just that whole thing came together and once it's in your, in your that, that image is in your mind, it's pretty hard to shake. Um, that's, a, that's the first step. I, I can't speak enough about having reference, having the having the animal or the subject there is of course a hundred percent the best way to do it we're not always able to do that like this this uh, night uh, Nike victory of Samothrace this uh, Greek or this Greek sculpture that was uh, that was done in a period uh, they just dug, dug it up about 2014 years ago and it was since restored and it's in the Louvre right now and it'll be on permanent display there. You can't always get, they wouldn't fly me there to do this thing, <laughs> which would have been great, but um, there, there is enough out there on this subject and with enough 3D, 3D programming and that type of thing that I was able to absorb as much as I could as, possible about the, the original artist and the sculptor and how he did it and the reason he did it and this was done for a person actually that uh, did his thesis on this and so he uses it in his lectures and, and studies and it's it's part of his life and that's why it meant something to him and uh, so but that's why it's done. I, although I didn't have it there before me I had images uh, through 3D printers, which I don't recommend. There's, there's, sometimes it's up to the programmer and how it works, but uh, it doesn't give you a whole lot. But with the the computer 3D imaging on on the internet is is pretty incredible, and it allows you to see things like there's a certain way that 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 material that's all one piece of material that wraps around her. And it's done in a in a very purposeful manner. So you have you have the more you can know about something, the less chance you are of, of having a guess. If you're guessing by 50-50 at best. So it's really important to have your reference to, and with an animal uh, animal studies or or things like that, it's just it's real critical. It, it, you can pick out something if it's not correct. You may not know why, but the piece will be uncomfortable. And if you can trace it back, you'll usually find it'll come down to some uh, a joint or some part of the anatomy that isn't working the way it's supposed to. So I just, I just really stress that because the more you know about a subject, the less guesswork and you're not going to be making any mistakes. If you knew everything, absolutely everything about something, you wouldn't make a mistake. There would be no need to because you're not guessing. And, and that's, to me, that's, that's pretty important. Now, may, maybe other people can get by with with less. I know uh, Rich Lawford, he's a, he's a very good sculptor. And uh, he has a huge knowledge and, and understanding of anatomy. So he could work off of photos only because he's so familiar. 
Uh, anybody else, you can't guess at the depth of a or the length of the scapula if you if you are looking at a picture or how deep it goes back. It's not like you you're just repeating what you see. You can't fake a shadow on a, on a sculpture because the depth has to show it. You can't just paint it in. And, and you have to know what's going on the other side of the animal while things are happening on this side. That's why you see things like in this in this longhorn, or not longhorn, I should sorry, a uh, highland steer. It's a, it's a very common position that you would find this in because they're after all, they, they graze and they chew the cud most of the day. So, but this displays a, a comfortable, relaxed animal with the way he's got this front legs played out. A lot of times they'll sit with all, all four legs like this, so they're ready to go. Um, they're just up and gone. Whereas this guy, he's more relaxed, so he's, he's just leaning back a little more comfortable. He's not and alert and, and he's, he's just enjoying a nice warm sunny day. So it's, it's those little things that I, I find really stand out to me when you see what they do at what time they do it. And uh, I just find it fascinating. So these are, these are just a few things that I think are, are important. I, I'm trying to get away, like I said, from as much detail and just show groups and, and things that make it important. Um, things that speak the most about what it is you're trying to get across. I, I'd rather not have somebody going around counting feathers. Um, it's not about that. We all know they have feathers and we know that if you want to try to carry the primaries off, is that what you're trying to show or are you just trying to show the coverage? The Alula? There's, there's different things you can try and bring out, but it's, it's your story and I believe that if you can have the person viewing it understand what you're doing and understand or get the feeling that you're trying to get across, you've achieved what you wanted to do. If uh, I don't believe, when I look at a piece of art like this, I don't want to have to I'd rather not guess at the story, I'd rather understand it and then I know, okay, I know where he's coming from, I get it. And uh, to me, that, that's when I've succeeded. And uh, that's, it's, it's a great way to spend time and it's just something that I am able to do. Why? I'm not necessarily sure. I, I, I'm, I'm blessed, I'm able to do it. Uh, it's taken a long time to develop techniques and processes and that kind of thing, but but the ability right at the get-go, right at the beginning to do it is something that's always thrilled me and I can't not do it. Uh, sometimes you, you would like to give it a break, but just being able to do it, just being able to come out with it, a lot of times I will I will be working on a piece and I have to stand back and I'm, I can only laugh to myself in the shop because you say, well, how can, you, how can it look like that? That is so cool. And I, I just, I really appreciate it and I love doing it. I don't know how not to do it. And um, it, I hope that it's something that encourages you, inspires you. It, it, it all has to start somewhere. If, uh, if anybody's interested in doing it, you can't fail by trying. You can only fail by not doing it. So, so the thing is that you will learn progressively. Each each sculpture. Sometimes you can you'll get it to where you want it and break it down. Start over, bring it up. You may do that ten times before you're happy with it. Nothing wrong with it. that's why it's clay. It's it's made to be used over and over again. And don't sell yourself short and don't let it go unless you're happy with it. Don't say, well, okay, good enough. Or, what is it that's not making it right? Because if you don't get to the point where you understand what made what went wrong, you're not going to be able to correct it on the next one. And I've seen it time and time again where a person's work will ne never change is because they, 
they get comfortable with their mis with the, their errors and think that it's it's okay. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I'm not I'm not the one to judge it. But when I look at something for myself or what I appreciate, those are things I look for. And uh, outside of that, as far as the reasons and and the things that I do and what I like to do, I could go through. A uh, little bit of an explanation on how bronze is accomplished. Um, there's, as the artist standpoint goes, I'm basically re responsible. I, I do the, the image, I do the form, I do it to completion in the clay. Some people do their own foundry work. I'm not one that does, I, I believe it's a, a real art in itself. And these people that have uh, done it have done it for years and they've got the techniques down. I want to do the best I can in the form that I'm working in. I want to leave the, the casting part to the people that are professional at it and, and they're able to re reproduce what it is that I did. And I don't want to just kind of let one end down just to say that I've done it from one end to the other. Uh, casting, could I learn it? I'm sure it could. I, I've been there at the foundry enough times working with them and, and uh, doing my patinas that you get a real good understanding of, of how it works and, and power to them, man. It's a, it's a process and, and they're very good at it. And I, this is a little plug just for the foundry I, I'm with. I'm with uh, Phil Trombley's uh, foundry, which is Joe Fafart's. And uh, I've been there again, blessed to been picked up by him that they're doing my casting because uh, uh, they're just tremendous people to work with. But onward, uh, these all these casts outside of the nativity scene are lost wax bronze, which means that I do the image in clay. And here's here's a couple of clay pieces over to on this table here that are just in the process, they're not finished yet. But they're little things that I'm working on. Um, so imagine those finished, they're complete. What I will do then is I take my image to the foundry. The foundry will make a mold. This is a rubber mold that's in here. You see? And what we have here. Is this is a perfect example because this is the nativity scene. I didn't get them to cast it. This is, a, like I said, a cold cast, so I, I made the mold myself. But what you have here is this image would be done in clay, just like we saw over with the, the chameleon and that uh, that young man there. So what we do then is we'd make a dam around here, and we'd put a fixotropic rubber, which is a it's a liquid rubber that holds itself up. It, it's thick enough to support itself. So what you do is you build this up, build this layer of rubber up over top of this. So you see, there it is. Now when that rubber sets up, of course, now we, we make the cut so we can take it off easily. Now this clay that we just took the mold off of. So I can see the inside. This, this, uh, clay that we took the mold of is now useless. It goes back into the melting pot and we use it for the next sculpture because that part's complete. Everything that we did in that clay is now suspended in this rubber. It's in this rubber mold. So what we do from there is we'll put this, this is a hard fiberglass mold that we put over this mold because if you put the weight and the liquid in, it has to have something to support the rubber from bending out of shape. So this supports everything. We fill this up with a layer of wax. So this will be wax that's built up in here to replace that clay. Now once we pull this mold off, and you pull this mold off, you get this in a clay image, the exact thickness that your bronze is going to be. So when you get this done, in the, in the wax, I'm sorry, what we'll do 
is that wax now gets sprued, which basically means little channels with these holding cups to allow the, the molten bronze in and allow the air and everything out so there's no bubbles trapped or anything like that. And then it's dipped into a, a ceramic slurry and usually gets between 30 and 35 dips. So what we have now is a ceramic shell that's built around that wax. So we take that ceramic shell and we put it in the oven to bake it and, and fire it so it can withstand the, the temperature of the bronze being poured into without exploding. When that is done, all the wax that was in there drains out. So now you have a void where that wax was that is now able to hold the bronze that you're pouring in. And when you have that bronze pour in and you see the bronze coming up the sprue holes and the air holes, you know you've got a complete pour. From that point on, it's a matter of just letting it cool until it's, it's handleable. Then you break the mold, break the plaster off it, and you've got your piece in bronze. From that point, a lot of people, you, you do a patina of some sort, which is basically the colors that you see here. These are all different chemicals. Some are cold reaction, but most of them come under heat. So what we'll do is you heat the, heat the bronze up to about well, 207 degrees, depending again on, on the chemical you're using. And uh, when that, when that, and they're typically acids which start a, a reaction with the metal and different chemical uh, acids give different colors and that's basically how that's achieved. So uh, you heat it up and you spray or brush or do whatever you want to get the colors or the, the look that you want to see. Um, and that is, can be, I, I would think, pretty toxic and, and pretty unhealthy. And these people are at the foundry, they're equipped with the, with the respirators and they do the things that are necessary that we may not have here. So, you know, leave it to the pros, I say, and, and uh, do your art. Now... So we're getting up to almost 30 minutes, which is doing great. Really? Um, do you want to talk about maybe stuff you're thinking about doing in the future or anything? Yeah, I, I would like to touch, but it's basically the same or me further and I, I, I'm wanting to go larger too. Have you started it yet? Oh, it's still recording, so I'll okay. just edit it after. No, I would, I would like to uh, discuss a little bit about what I'm, what I'm trying to accomplish in, uh, down the road. I've got a, um, some human forms I'm, I'm really excited about doing. Uh, Sort of, uh, well, I guess just because of the time, kind of 1984-ish type of work, um, if anybody's familiar with that. It used to be required weeding when I was a kid. But, um, and things like, I want to do, I'd like to do some life-size pieces or, or perhaps even monumental. Bigger pieces anyway, and I want to try to even loosen up some more and, and just bring some more flow rather than again like I say the detail. The detail you can't avoid but it's like I said it's where it's needed. The face, the attitude, the, the, the things that make it what it is, the, the muzzle of this cup or the, the tooth on the falcon, uh, the, the look in its eyes, the, the focus, the, the way the mandible works, those things very very important. Just the, the, the petty singles or the, or the toes. I, I don't do each one perfect, but there's detail all the way through that show you, make it believable. It becomes very believable without having to see it all. You're seeing what you need to see. Like, uh, I don't have to show every, every hoof exactly the same. You can see the hoofs. You, the ones you do see are correct. You, you know, it, it just, Making it like this otter. Um, the water was uh, as much fun to do as the otter itself. But the otter is a very maternal animal. And it, it just spends all its time with the pup. And it's just constantly grooming and cleaning it. And the pup is oblivious to what's going on. It's just sleeping. You need to show us the otter. Yeah. 
here's the otter. You can see the, the, the pup is sleeping now, which they spend a great deal of time doing. But it's, it's hilarious to watch them. She'll tip that thing over to do, clean its back or groom its back. The head will be underwater and it's it's still sleeping. It doesn't wake up, it just shuts down its breathing until it gets brought back out. And they're just totally at home, totally comfortable without ever going on to land. And it just kind of blows me away the way they anchor themselves in the kelp. And the other thing, the beauty about doing this sculpture is you have to go hunt out the re reference and you have to go look at them and you have to do all this stuff and the things you learn about them as you're going, it's incredible. Like who would have thought that this otter has over a million hairs per square inch. This thing has a million hairs per square inch. The human head has about a hundred thousand head uh, per on its head. hundred thousand hair. This has got a million per square inch and that's why this is the only animal that lives in the ocean all year without blubber. It's just it's just their fur that keeps them warm, whereas every other animal needs the blubber to keep them insulated. So it's 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 just amazing how things are built to do what they do, and uh, I don't know, I find that absolutely inspiring. And and just you think water is water until you try to do it and, and you see the way it moves and the way it slaps and splashes and, and bubbles and swirls and it's uh it's just it's all very enjoyable so i don't know if i was able to help you too much but it's um something i am really quite passionate about and i'm i'm very thankful i've been able to do it for so long and and just enjoy it so much and and uh it's been a big part of my life, all my life, and my wife and family, they all know um, how important it is. And it's not for any other reason, it just it, it keeps me whole. It keeps me, keeps me thinking and, and of the things that I find important to me. Uh, life is, we all know, is, is, can, be, can be a struggle and can be hard, and, and we do the best we can, but when we can come into something and we can get some peace and some relaxation and just some just some fuel, or, or I, I don't even know how to put it, it just it energizes me when I get to witness this stuff and be able to have the opportunity to do it. It's just, I don't know what to say. Uh, I'm just really thankful and I, I hope you enjoyed it and I'd like to speak to you guys again sometime about the wood part of things because that after all it took a, a lot of the years of my life and, and some of the big monumental stuff that I did for for different different things like superheroes, uh, 12 foot chicken, 18 foot superhero, king wheat, for but just all this, it, it's, it's been fascinating and, and enjoy all of it and, and the medium really doesn't matter, it's, it's being able to do it, it doesn't matter what you do it in you will develop your, your own way and, and the way to use the medium will way to the way you would change things and it's exciting and it's something that never ends. There's no end to this. You can go to wherever you want. If you're getting stagnant in what you're doing, you gotta change what you're doing. And that's that's simple as that. Move on to a different technique or move on to something different because if this doesn't get you juiced up every time you walk into the studio, um, I don't know what to tell you. Now I'm not saying that you just can't wait to get in the studio. That's not what I'm saying at all. It takes a, a lot of discipline a lot of times because you don't want to. You know, like a carpenter doesn't want to go home and do work at the house. So, but once you're in there, just getting in there, once you're in there, the time will go away. But it can be a struggle getting in. So don't let any of that stuff, just do it. Enjoy. I hope you enjoyed this talk and we'll see you later.